Welcome to Shop Talk Live, episode number 211. This episode, I'm joined by Mike Pekovic and Barry Dima, and we discuss angling stock through a planer, and if it's the same thing as skewing your hand plane, whether you should take that stash of old vintage machinery that your grandfather used to use, some pre-finishing do's and don'ts, and we talk more in depth about shop aprons and shop pencils than anyone could possibly imagine. So if you're wondering if this is kind of a geeky episode, there's your answer. But first I've got a quick announcement. It's a little bit of a downer. Unfortunately, in light of the growing concerns around the coronavirus and recommendations from the health authorities to limit large scale gatherings, we've made the decision to cancel Fine Woodworking Live 2020. It's a bummer. But that's what we're dealing with these days, and it's better to be safe than sorry. If you're a long-range planner, throw April 16th through 18th of 2021 on the calendar for our next Fine Woodworking Live. Uh, So that's about it. We're going to hear a quick word from one of our sponsors, and then we'll get to the show. For more than 90 years, Woodcraft has been supplying woodworkers with quality tools, supplies, and advice. For the best in hand tools, power tools, and shop essentials, you can count on Woodcraft from start to finish. Check them out for woodworking classes, free demos, and project advice from knowledgeable, friendly staff. With 75 stores nationwide, you can find a store in your neighborhood or shop woodcraft.com for your favorite woodworking brands. Woodcraft, helping you make wood work since 1928. I was I was going to include one of the questions that Anissa sends in to the Shop Talk Live. Oh yeah, but I'm, Anissa emails the Shop Talk Live email. Yeah. You didn't know that. No. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> it's like she'll be bored. She'll be like, "Why is the dust collection on my table saw not work? What is up? <laughs> what is up with that?" <laughs> Dear Mike, Barry, and Ben. <laughs> but one of them that she sent in was. Does this job ruin you? Do you, like, have a hard time spelling rabbit in real-life situations? Or do you, you know, what are things that that enter into your brain that wouldn't normally enter into your brain? And I was driving in this morning, and I passed, like, a dump truck going up a hill. And it was green. And I looked at it in my rearview mirror, and I thought, oh, it's a power Mac. <laughs> 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 when I looked closer, it was like old Powermatic green with a gray stripe. Hmm. And I was like, oh, look at that Powermatic truck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I was watching um, YouTube with Anna when she was home. We watched the Bone App channel. Mm, cool. And one of the episodes was a professional chef uh, talking about how he sharpens his knives. So you do watch those? And I'm like, all right, bring it on. I want to see this. And it's like he pulls out some Shaptons. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. that's not bad. <laughs> he talks about flattening them, and then he talks about, you know, sharpening and honing at angles. And it's like I'm just the whole time I'm giving Anna, like, the backseat narrative. It's like, all right, that's not bad. Okay, yeah, he knows what he's – and it's like, what? This guy's really good. And it was, he got, like, through the entire thing, and I was tremendously impressed. It's like he can sharpen better than probably 90% percent of us woodworkers can but i guess like a knife a chef knife it's got to be sharp to work like you know what sharp is yeah but i mean that's what our viewers do to us you know that right uh, i okay <laughs> <laughs> and that you have like the curved blade and the weird bevel like you, there's a lot more control involved it's and it's like by hand you're maintaining the yeah. angle by hand and all that kind of stuff and you know how like you he you just kind of shave your arm hair a little bit to see if it's sharp. Mm-hmm. So he did it, and he kept doing it and doing it, and he just got kind of into it, and he, like, <laughs> literally shaved his entire <laughs> forearm. So anyway. I was I was really surprised. I was talking to um, Hap from Nanohone one time. Yeah. He said woodworkers are a small percentage. Yeah, yeah it's sure. It's all chefs. Yep. It's yep. like those guys probably think about sharpening way more than we yes, do. Yes, absolutely. I Probably that's true. Yeah. Oh, I should add something. When I was shaving my head, <laughs> I didn't want to get into straight razors because I didn't trust my ability to sharpen a straight edge, yeah. like a, a cutthroat. Oh. And that was that that was a 
a big moment of self-reflection. Like, no, I can't mm. handle that. I'm not there. So then I started growing my hair out. It's, pr- <laughs> it's pretty telling that, like, that's what comes in. Oh, I'm shaving my head now. Can I do it with a straight razor? Oh, yeah. It's like, what? what? Oh, yeah. It's like two seconds into the first shave in your head. Like, booze. I'm going to do this with a straight <laughs> razor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, let's answer some questions. Uh, this one was probably uh, from the table next to us at lunch one day. <laughs> this is about 70% of what we talk about at lunch. So I figure we might as well. From Curtis, I need a new shop apron. I've been using a leather apron that's too small. I like the one that Mike Pekovich is wearing on the hanging wall cabinet video. It has pencil holders and pockets and seems well organized. Can you recommend good shop aprons? And I feel like we should maybe think about what constitutes a good shop apron. We can recommend the aprons we have or or that we like. But yeah. I think I think, you know, I've always argued that shop aprons are kind of like pants. What you know, the brand that fits you might not fit me. It's not just fit, it's also how do you want it to function? Yeah. Some right. people have no pockets in theirs. So they just want it literally an apron to wipe glue on during glue ups or something. And other people are just like See, that's foreshadowing, Anissa. <laughs> <laughs> like that's foreshadowing. <laughs> uh, so I, I agree it's a personal thing. I don't think there's one right answer. Yeah. Um, I'm actually Oh, here comes. I mean, I'm in transition. Mm-hmm. And but to blow up this question. <laughs> One of the problems is, so the apron I have, I like it quite a bit, but the pockets were not ideally suited for me and what I wanted to hold in the apron. So my wife who sews, she kind of hot rotted this apron for me to get it exactly where I want it. And I really like it. The problem I have is a lot of people say, oh, that's cool. What apron is it? And it's like, well, here's the brand, but all the pockets are wrong. So I feel like you know, I don't feel – I like to be able to offer solutions to people who ask, like, what chisel is that? What plane is that? Yeah. And so when you say what apron, the problem is that, well, it's this, but I did a lot of things to it. And I wouldn't – I don't think as it is off the shelf, I don't think it's a, suited for woodworkers' needs. So I am currently changing brands. Oh, I know. <laughs> I love this. And this is a big thing. So I, I won't, I'll talk about it later when I actually get it. But I went to a different company. Well, first I, I talked to this company. I said, would you by any chance be able to do custom apron? The first I mean, apron pocket that configurations, have. right. Yeah. And they said, no, sorry, we really can't do that. Um, so then I talked to uh, Jason at Texas Heritage because, Ben, you had a Texas Heritage and he <laughs> did some custom stuff for you. And I talked to Jason. I said, can you – do some really weird pocket configurations for me. He said, yeah, no problem. Um, I think really weird pocket configurations where it's, like, <laughs> it's upside down, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when they fill with sawdust. I so I want them to be totally non-functional, but I still want them there. <laughs> I, I, I want the pockets completely open on the bottom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Number one, I think that Texas Heritage aprons, as they are, as they're currently configured, because I'm wearing one that I stole from a friend, <laughs> just to see if the fit is right. Because yeah. if, if it's yeah. not a comfortable apron, w- w- who cares if the pockets are right? So I wore this Texas Heritage I got from my friend, and I like the fit, the comfort of it. And in wearing it, I kind of thought about, okay, but these pockets are a little bit different for me. However, even though I'm going to change a pocket configuration, I think their standard configurations and they offer options is like a really good thing. Yeah. Um, But I am doing a custom thing, and I don't know if it's actually going to be a really good thing or not before I recommend it. So I'm going to – when I get it, I'm going to use it, and then I'll let you know what I did to it and whether or not – that was a good idea or not. Cool. And I'm getting my little logo embroidered across the chest. That's the best part. I know. <laughs> it's like, you got to do it. It's like, is that dumb? Yeah, it's pretty dumb. Is that cool? That's yeah, it's kind of cool. Too. <laughs> so, so anyway, yeah, so I'm, I'm in between. Um, and I'll let you know. So I think, you know, I would say Texas Heritage right now, even as is. And there are some options when you go on the website 
to me, I think that's a super apron and it's made by a guy, which I think is like really, yeah, really important. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think that's really cool too. Sweet. I have, like you said, I have a Texas heritage and, um, like I did mine with no bottom pockets. Uh, right. Okay. Cause I didn't like bumping into a workbench and feeling like there was something in there that I didn't want to crush or, you know, it just, I was always uncomfortable with things in bottom pockets of aprons, but this is probably the third apron that I've had. So at this point, cause a Texas heritage apron is not a cheap option. No, but you're again, you're buying it. It's customized. It's exactly what you want. It's probably a, a lifetime purchase. Yeah. So I thought, okay, I know what I want in an apron now. And he was, he was really great. And I had no bottom pockets, two little leather straps for, at the time I used to plane hammer a lot. Um, and I was working in the old shop at 191. And one problem that I had with that place was it was so large that if you got something on your hands and you want to wipe it off oh i have to go all the way across three rooms to yeah. go get a paper towel so i just yeah. had a rag hanging off cool. um for me i like having i've got a little veritas square in one pocket a pencil a marking knife and then i have a larger pocket which sometimes has a card scraper in it sometimes has my phone in it yeah and that's about it. Okay. Um, I just like having protection from glue. I like having those tools that are constantly used. Yeah. Right there. Um, but I, there are some things that I would change on the next iteration. I wish that the pocket pencil, the pocket hold, the pencil holders were on the right side. Oh. I'm right-handed, so I'm going to grab my pencil with... And You don't like the reach across. I don't like the reach across because I wind up hitting that, that square. Oh. I think most people like the reach across because it's a more natural movement. Hmm. My square sticks out and hits my yeah. wrist every time I grab uh, my pencil. Yeah, I don't keep my square up high, so yeah. I could see that. Yeah, yeah. That, so, like, these are things that you don't know until you know, and they're, they're not going to be universal. Right. Um, I really like how um, Tim Rousseau has his dust collector thing on a little snap uh, that snaps to his apron. That's what I got the leather with the D-rings on either side of my okay, apron down below. Yep. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think what other features I've seen in an apron that I would like to include in another so when you design, when you came up with your pocket configuration and you've submitted yours, right, Mike? Yes. Do you, do you know what you want to put in from the start and go from there? Or are you looking to like maximize space? You know what I mean? Like you got two D rings because you may want yeah. to put this collection on one side or the other. I'm pretty specific now. And the big question for me is like, okay, here's all the stuff that fits in my apron right now. Mm -hmm. But if I had more room, is there like what ideally would I want to throw in there too? What I don't want, I don't like a pocket with more than one thing in it that I have to kind of reach right. around for. Yeah. Um, like having a six inch combo square and my tape measure in the same pocket, I don't like. Um, so I'm trying to be super specific about, no, I came up, okay, what's going here? What's going here? What's going mm -hmm. here? Um, I didn't start wearing an apron until I started teaching a lot. Um, and that's, especially like Bob Van Dyke school, um, it's so spread out and you have to like walk 50 yards just to go get a, you know, yeah. socket wrench and uh -huh. then go all the way back. It's like, oh, I forgot my square. So when I started teaching and moving around a lot, that's when I started wearing apron just to keep my essential tools with me. Um, and so it isn't like, so my apron is always outfitted with the exact thing in the exact pocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like to me, it's got to be super organized that way. Like, I like, where's my combo square? Where's, where's my pencil sharpener? Where's my two inch square? Where's my, um, scraper, all that good kind of stuff. Um, and then also for me, once I got used to wearing it, just that, just that ritual coming into the shop, putting your apron on, yeah. it's like, are you serious about getting some work done or are you just going to kill five minutes and not get anything done? Yep. So, 
Um, that's the thing for me. If it's like, no, I don't need my apron. I'm just going to go do this. And this is like, oh, great. Where's my pencil? Okay. <laughs> stop. You know, go put it on and get back to work. Cool. Yeah. It, I shop size plays so much into what I would want in my apron. Yeah. And, and now I'm, I'm really glad that I went a minimalist route because I have a smaller shop. I just need the things that I need on me. My combo square, if I had a six inch combo square, I would maybe make room. But I don't, and or I have one that I don't trust. My 12-inch, which is my go-to, yeah. I don't want that sticking no. on my apron. That's right. too fragile. Um, there's a company, Dragonfly, that they do. It's kind of cool how they do it where they send you – do they send you like a, a cheap – are like they the muslin. leather aprons? Yeah. Those are nice. Yeah. And they, they send you a cheap muslin apron that you could put on you and then like draw on where you want things. Yeah. And then you send it back to them and they use that as the template. Um, <clears throat> for me, that doesn't work because I don't want that much stuff. But if you right. were somebody who was like, no, I'm, this is my prepper apron, my prepper slash woodworking apron. Yeah. Then that's <laughs> <laughs> that's what I want, you know. Um, but uh, the other thing that I think needs to be considered is the fabric. Yeah. I have a waxed apron. Yeah. And I think it gets hot sometimes. I wish I I kind of want to just throw it in the wash or whatever and de-wax it sometimes. Okay. I'm going with a uh, regular canvas. My Current apron is canvas, and it's fine, except when I teach at Mark Adams every July, and it's like 90 degrees, 90% 90 humidity. I'm convinced over a week that apron gains like 10 <laughs> pounds. <laughs> it, it's so heavy. So I think I would like a non-absorbent <laughs> apron. Um, and I imagine leather, to me, leather m might seem to be heavy, but I've never used it, so I don't know. I don't know either. I got a leather apron as a gift and I returned it. In part, it was really heavy. I'm like, I don't I don't want to move around in this. But it was like a big, almost down to the knees, wide. It wasn't like Tim Rousseau's, which is yeah. just like a like a catcher's vest. You know, it's like it's really it's trim. Tim Rousseau's is like an apron with many stories. <laughs> <laughs> you look at it and you're like yeah, you ever hear the what expression you... like that man looks like an old leather glove? That old leather glove looks like Tim Rousseau's <laughs> apron. <laughs> so, what do you have on your apron? A whole bunch of glue. <laughs> <laughs> looks like an elephant sneezed on me, and it's just. And so, part of it is I have a really small shop. I think it's like seven by ten, and I only use five gallon buckets of glue. <laughs> right. <that's right. laughs> um, and so. I have a tool right in front of my bench. Everything is right there. Yeah. The pencils are two steps to my right. My planes are – not that I would hang a plane on my shop paper, <laughs> so let me backtrack that. But everything's right there. Um, and when I worked at the old shop, I do wish I had a rag on me. So one might have lived in a pocket. But I had the tool well and my toolbox, and that's where things were. Yeah. You know? um, so mine is just an enormous piece of denim that runs, I think, beneath my knees, and it's wide. And I just use it to wipe glue on because I don't have rags sitting about. So just, you know, wipe out some squeeze off, squeeze out, rub it on the apron. Yeah. And it's kind of nearing the end of its life. Like you're looking, you're now, I'm now have to hunt for a clean spot to rub glue, which I feel oh, like I just, there's, there's a spot on mine. Is that's, it like a that's... stalagmite? Like, is it like <laughs> <laughs> it's growing? <laughs> um, it's like an apron goiter. But but I love I love it mostly, especially because I took the back. It was a tie around the waist thing, yeah. and I modified it so it's a crisscross. So you can just slip into it and slip out, which is nice. I'm like, oh, I just glued up something. Let me get on the apron. Yeah, kind of. Oh, so you don't have any intent. So I all right. In case nobody knew this. I'm not a small person. <laughs> <laughs> and one issue that I do have with mine is that it, it attaches on one side yeah. and I can't get my second arm around there because I'm not a small person. <laughs> and so I have to do it one handed. And I, I, 
every time it's a little frustrating. So I wish it was a Why are you going behind your back? You, back. Can't, you can't do – I'm just doing this. Well, no, because it's, oh, it's, it's actually there. far enough away that okay. I, can, I can't really get that either. I'm, I'm maybe – maybe I don't know. I'm sort of – have a similar problem in that the little spring catch – on the Texas Heritage I'm using, it's kind of, okay, it's not on the small side, it's normal size, but my hands are a bit on the bulky side. And I find <laughs> that getting over there and trying to get that with my thumb, so I ask specifically, can you put a bigger spring catch on there? It's like, yeah, yeah, we can do that too. It's like, yes. So, but cool. one of the catch it, because you guys treat your aprons pretty nicely, like you don't, you're not rubbing glue all over them. No, I do. A little bit, yeah, sure. Okay. Michael Fortunes is the king of the glue apron. I think that thing just stands up by itself. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he's got he's got a retract like one of those. Um, oh, I love that. He's got the pencil on the little zip cord. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that, that retracts, yeah. and he's got an eraser on and one it, too. Wow, separate. Wow. <laughs> um, wait, you had mentioned something. Oh no, I I treat mine like. I beat mine up. All right. And I have actually gone into a classroom situation and like everybody pulls out their aprons and it's yeah. all nice and neat. I was like, oh. I know. I know. <laughs> mine doesn't have a logo. I has got glue and milk paint all no, over it. Oh, you're like, check this out. I actually did not put it on. Oh. I was a little ashamed because seriously, everybody had like, bam, like bright, shiny aprons. And oh. I felt like mine was like the, the old beat up. Honda. Oh, you got to pull the, oh, your apron's still shiny, huh? All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you got to like you got to break that thing in. Yeah. And you can't like fake break it in like stonewashed apron. <laughs> <laughs> you have to earn that. Hey Jason, there you go. Stonewashed aprons. So, you know, I added a little Tarnished pocket the copper rivets. I'm adding a pocket in this one specifically for lens cap. Mm. Yes. That is the most Pekovic thing I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Because, man, you take that. It's like, okay, where did I leave it? What pocket is it in? Boom. It's in the lens cap pocket, that, sucker. That's why I like wearing button-up shirts on shoots. They kind of untuck when I adjust the lights, but that breast pocket is yeah. for the lens cap. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the back pocket's lens cap for me. Yeah. All right. That is more than anyone thought could be said about aprons. Were you at tea time when we were talking about aprons? <laughs> And our, Liz, our copy editor, so we sit at a round table. Liz, our copy editor, is just staring out the window, but you can kind of see, like, clenching her jaw. And I forget what she happened. She does that every time you talk. It was. <laughs> she was silent for the whole 5, 10, 30-minute apron conversation. And Betsy, our admin, said, hey, Liz, what's up? She goes, I'm in the twilight zone right now. <laughs> uh, it was great. So then we stopped talking about aprons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Question number two is from Robert. There's often a recommendation to run boards through a planer at a slight angle in order to produce a shearing cut. It seems to me that since the roller and blades remain at the same angle to each other, all this accomplishes is producing angled planer marks rather than improving the cut by shearing. It seems fundamentally different than using an angled, than angling a hand plane, which does change the angle of the blade relative to the angle of attack. So, does feeding the stock through a planer at an angle really do anything? It does, and you're right. It's not the same thing as skewing a plane. It is the same thing at planing with a hand plane diagonally across the grain, which can reduce tear out because you're if you think of all the figure in a board or the grain changing happening um let's say perpendicular to the edges of the board like straight across like a speed bump bump you know you go straight across you hit it all at once but if you drive across it at an angle your tires hit it at different rates and you can go faster over it so i think by skewing a plane a board going through a planer you are changing the angle at which that the grain direction changes intersect with the cutter head. So it's not hitting all at once. That is maybe you're lowering the that angle a little bit by skewing it to get a slightly better cut. So I think you're correct. It's not exactly the same, but I do think there's a benefit. 
So then do you expect to get a really, not just to avoid tear out by twisting or skewing the board through a planer, are you also expecting a really nice cut? You know what I mean? Like, because if you plane across the grain or, or yeah. like with a hand plane right. or at 30 degrees to right. it, it's not an awesome surface. Right. Are you expecting an awesome surface off of the machine? Like, is there a benefit with the really high speed? It's just reducing tear out. Uh-huh. It's just if I can just start with less of a mess, it's going to be easier to get rid of it. And I had a segmented cutter head, so who cares? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get it. There you go. Yeah. Done. So I am guilty of pretending often that I don't know why certain things happen or whatever. But this is one that I will admit. I don't understand the whole skewing a plane, a hand plane, changing the angle of attack thing. And in preparation for this episode, I went back and I reread some stuff and nothing ever entirely made sense. I've never had the aha moment on that. Can you explain that? I think, I mean, skewing a a hand plane in relation to the wood does two things. Um, I think the the more significant thing is it is it creates more of a slicing action, yeah, which I think can give you a cleaner cut. That I get. So that's just, and then the second thing it does, and this runs counter, um, is that it actually lowers the effective angle of the blade. That I don't get. So, um, the geometry of it. Yeah. Oh, um, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I forget who I saw explain it, but they took... Okay, so (laughs) you've got the, let's say, like you've got the bevel of the blade. So let's say it's a quarter inch wide, right? Yeah. So going straight, it's a quarter inch front to back. But as you skew that, um, for instance, if you skew it at 45 degrees, you actually, I believe you double it. So now there's actually, you know, a, a half inch effective width of that bevel. So in essence, if you think about that, the angle of the blade is say at 45, if you angle that at 45 degrees and then cut straight, you're lowering that effective angle. Okay, so uh, Stanley number four or whatever, is 45 yeah. degree yeah. batting. You skew the plane, yeah. push it forward. It is acting like a lower angle. Lower angle. Right which is not likely to reduce tear out. This is true. In fact, Chris Bexford says... This is where I'm confused. Okay. Yeah. So this is where you, Chris Bexford says you go at a steeper angle and, you know, you're going to get a better cut. Um, and then he also recommends skewing. And it's like, well, Chris, you say go to a steeper angle, but when you skew the plane, you're actually lowering the angle. And he's like, yeah, but it works better. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. His answer is, yeah. So I think what he's saying is, yeah, I'm reducing that angle a little bit, but at the same time, I'm introducing more of a slicing cut, okay. which is beneficial. Okay. So Andrew Hunter argues that you want to use who, I mean, he gets astoundingly good hand plane finishes and he the uses best. as, yes. Whoa. I, I admit that. It's what, when, he, did you see the beam that he sent or the yeah. be beam that he sent in? Did you touch it? Yes. <sighs> no one was around. <laughs> Even like the knot was glass. This, was, yeah, on pine. Yeah, on pine, right. This just hard mirror finish. And I'm always like, okay, your sharpness is, it's really, I don't care about the shaving. I don't care about the micron, all this. What's the surface it leaves behind? Yeah. And my stuff is sharp and I hit pine and it's, it leaves a nice surface on pine. But when I saw this thing from Andrew's, like, okay. That is a whole level of sharpness <laughs> that I am unfamiliar with. Yeah. So, but he, you, he argues you want to use as low of an angle as you can get away with, right? Right. But that's also because he's dealing with softwood. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, Andrew, here's a piece of white oak. Give this a try. Right. Yeah. I don't think he's sticking at 37. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, Higher angle does not necessarily give you a better finish. It reduces your chances of tear out. Yeah, sure. So skewing does not reduce your chance of tear out. It gives you a better finish. Sure. Yeah, that combination. So yeah. you're dealing with two different elements, and you're balancing between the two. Yeah. 
raise the bed angle better with tear out leaves a little fuzzier finish depends on how far you go yeah how far. skew the blade you gain some of that back maybe yeah i mean like the ultimate high angle is a scraper yeah and that because there's so much compression going on, you are getting, you know, a, just not the same quality finish as a hand plane. And it, it took me a while to realize that, that that was the case where, like, I would hand plane, I have a little spot of tear out. And so I'd take the scraper to it and then I'd feel it. I go, ah, oh, crap, what, 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 yeah. what happened? Yeah. And so I go back with the hand plane and then I get more <laughs> tear out. And, yeah. So I think I understand it more now. All right. Hopefully the listeners do too. I do, and I'm listening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Should we talk about our all-time favorite tools of all time for this week? Yeah. Barry? I'll go. Okay, man. Barry's, Barry's during the Can't headline. I remember the brand name. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Man. I had to re-remember mine three times this morning. But And I meant to write it down. Then I didn't write it down because I was afraid Mike would steal it. <laughs> Um, mine is using a really, it's, I'm saying it like a technique. Mine is using a Blackwing 602 in the shop. Oh, okay. That was almost mine. <laughs> <laughs> I no. love Blackwing 602s. I have a history of yearning after these pencils, almost paying $100 for a box of these pencils. Then when they were reintroduced to the market, I sought them out, bought them, gave them to my friends. I love these pencils. They are an indulgence. They are one of those buy this expensive thing instead of buying 10 cheap things to me. But I never brought them into the shop. What color? The gray the ones? gray one. Okay. Yeah. I never brought them into the shop because that felt like, that felt beneath the pencil. I understand that. And what a stupid sentence that was. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad using them just to like write my to-do list. It's a very joyful experience <laughs> writing the to-do list. I'm like, you deserve better. Let me give you to John Tatro. <laughs> <laughs> you should be drawing beautiful right. wood grain. Um I didn't want to bring it into the shop, and I know Michael Cullen. Like when he, when you take a class with Michael Cullen, it's like here's a he hands out six o twos, and it's like maybe he doesn't hand them out, but he gives a dissertation on he gave, the joys of using a pencil. He gave me one. He gave you one. Yes. Yeah. It's a little short, but the, that's, that's okay. even better. Uh, right. <laughs> this has been touched by Michael Cullen. Yeah. <laughs> this, this has got the juju. Yeah. Um. So. I I hesitated, and I think you you started using 602s. Yeah. You time. gave yeah. a lot of us. You gave us, like, four pencils. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a Ticonderoga number two until I die guy. But you gave us these black wings. What do they say? Half, Half the, the pressure, twice the speed. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a nice pencil. <laughs> <laughs> So, and then Michael Cullen gave me one too, and it's just like, oh. So I'm kind of like, I'm using your, the gray ones, um, because they're not, the hardness isn't designated by numbers, designated by the color of the pencil, the paint. So the black is the softest, the gray is medium, and then the clear cedar finish is the harder. And, and there's the, a white as well. Is yes. That, okay. But even the hardest one is still. I think it's about like a number two pencil, like a regular oh, wow. Ticonderoga. So right now I've got the clear cedar in the shop that I'm using. I use the gray at work for my thumbnail sketches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm True. almost thinking about switching it up, trying it out. And I'm also now, I'm testing out three different pencil sharpeners to determine which Sorry, I did this edge too. I'm getting. Are they all double pencil, <laughs> like two holes? Do you have any three holes? The sharpener, pencil sharpener. Just the two, the two hole where you do the one mm -hmm. and then you get the fine point. Yeah, two stage. One. The two stage, yeah. Not right. just like, these are for crayons. Right. <laughs> <laughs> pencil sharpener is in the side of a cardboard bus. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. What I have found, though, is I put 
I put a black wing in my apron and it stays in the apron. I don't know if it is just, I don't know if it's less likely to wander off because I love it so much uh -huh. and I care for it. Um, but also I, it doesn't break. It doesn't it break. Doesn't. I rarely have to sharpen it in the shop. It, I sharpen it less in the shop than I do at my desk. Because mm. at my desk, I'm looking for, ooh, look at ooh, yeah. I'm going to write something. <laughs> sharpen my pencil. <laughs> do, do, do. And I do. I make that do, do, do sound every time. I know. But this is <laughs> office life. You know, like, I got to write something. going to sharpen my pencil. Yes. That, that's a cubicle job. If anybody ever asked you what a cubicle job's like, that's what it is. <laughs> um, but in the shop, it's like, pull it out, boom. And I feel like with the Ticonderogas or with the whatever freebie pencil I had lying around, Connecticut Valley pencil, <laughs> <laughs> um, they break. Okay. And I spend half my time sharpening. You know, it's like you pull it out. Oh, I got to sharpen it. And the black wing, I have not had that problem. But so. also like, okay, I need a pencil. And the minute you touch your pencil, you're aware you're using your black wing. So yes. you bring a certain mindfulness Maybe, yeah. to when you use it, which I think enhances and informs the process. Yeah. So I think the tool you use does affect the work that you do. So so are you sold? Is that your Oh, I'm sold. Shop I, I might, in my car, I have a white and a black that I might sharpen up and experiment with. But that said, once for me, once a pencil is dedicated to a space, that's where it stays. Like I've used at my desk the same Blackwing 602 for a year and a half now probably, and it's starting to get a little short. But like that's my desk pencil. Mm -hmm. There are others around in case my desk catches on fire. But we know if my desk catches on fire, I'm grabbing that pencil first. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to wander. That might just be it for mm -hmm. a while. Cool. All right. We talked enough about pencils. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. I'm thinking about <laughs> my favorite pencil at home. Out on aprons, geeking out on pencils. Yeah. This is... Because my, my uh, probably <coughs> most significant job at work for me is when I get together with editors like Barry after a photo shoot, we'll come in and edit all the photos down, and I have a little piece of paper um, where I thumbnail out the entire article, and I always bring like a brand new, freshly sharpened number two Ticonderoga with a fresh eraser. And if the eraser gets a little rounded, I give that to somebody else. If it gets too short, I give it to somebody else. So that pencil is part of that process. Mm -hmm. And now I'm switching to the black wing with the two stage hand sharpener. Yeah, I, get that right I did it. And the take. replaceable eraser. Yes, that's also important. It's, yes. Yeah, I did a triple take the first time you walked into a thumbnail with a non-Ticonderoga. Because it was like, you don't touch Mike's pencil. No. And so you're very aware of where the Ticonderoga is on the table. And then it was a Blackwing 602. It's like, what is, are you punking me? It's my <laughs> Ashton Kutcher around. Like, and if you touch the Ticonderoga, it's yours. Yeah. You just, go ahead, take it with you. <laughs> but you feel like you failed. Like, no, no, that's yours now. You yes. take it. Like, it's a reminder to not, like, Oh. What's your tool, Barry? Uh, the Sterling Dovetail Square. It is oh. so picture a double square or the the handle being yeah. anvil of a double square, but instead of a ruler, it has a very thin strip of metal, um, and it's stepped. So on the thinner end, I don't know, an eighth inch wide, okay, three sixteenths, yeah, and on the other end, it's a quarter yeah. plus. I forget. What do you use that for? So when you're sawing your tails, you check those for square. Okay. And when you nail those well, square. Barry does, Mike. I know, right. And you <laughs> don't have a table saw with a blade ground eight and a half degrees. I, but, I but, understand what you're saying. Yeah. But it's to guarantee, oh, my tails are good. When I'm fixing the joint, it's only the pins. Yes. And right. so that has really helped the process of me hand cutting dovetails, which isn't to sound romantic. It's just how I got to do them. And it has helped me not compartmentalize. What's the word? Structure the process. Yeah. Mm. So I'm not constantly chasing different tails. Exactly. Like, and that has helped a ton. And I'm excited to get to use it on like check tenons or like, it's just a nice tight little square for little areas. Cool. But I, I think I'm nailing down my dovetailing kit. Mm. Nice. Like, like a pencil. That's, um, <laughs> Like flattened on one. End. Oh, okay, that's a Bob thing. Yeah. What does he call it? Like a mouse or something? Yeah. 
but it's helped me chase the smudge. It just gets into areas better. Yeah. And but the ta- the dovetail square was a really big part of that. Cool. Guaranteeing square. Yeah. Cool. So I'm a big fan. And it feels really well made. Like it's just like this is quality. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So it does it slide? It or is it fixed? It's not fixed. It slides. You don't really want it to slide. So the wider part of the beam is what the, I don't know the words, what the anchor in that, the square's handle attaches to. It's kind of a U shape. Got and it. as you screw it tight, it pinches the beam in Got place. It. Okay. So, so like on the combo square, there's that channel in the middle of yeah. the ruler that engages. Yes. Oh. This just engages around the wider end okay. of the doubles. So you can slide it, but. I'm not sure there's a reason to because you're going to move away. I just wonder if you could shorten it up to test how vertical your pin walls are with it. Oh, uh, no. You would have to chop it, I think. Oh, okay. Test how vertical your pin walls are. Yeah, I, don't I, think if, I don't think it could make it short enough. Okay. I might be thinking of a different square. Like standard there. thickness, yeah. All right. Huh. I like the fact that you're dialing in your system yeah it as feels opposed good. to like because i think so many people struggle with dovetails because they take they they it's like sharpening you know change this change that constantly moving the the system and with dovetailing mm-hmm. it's like now get your system consistent hone it and then change something right but it's that understanding of a lot of us like when we're cutting tails by hand we're worried more about the angle of the saw on the face oh, yeah. as opposed to being square across that end grain and that squareness across the end grain to your point if you're not square you're creating a nightmare when it comes to fit your pins right yeah, yeah. so cool yeah. mike i don't know i'm going either I'm through a blooming process into <laughs> a new and improved woodworker or a midlife crisis. I feel like I've been in a, in a place of stasis for at least the last five years in terms of the tools that I own, like my apron, my block plane, my pencil, my pencil sharpener, um, all these things. It's just, I could just tell you what it is, but now it's like, I'm, I'm transitioning aprons. I'm transitioning pencils. Um, I'm transitioning pencil sharpeners, and I was just given recently the little um, Lee Nielsen bronze apron block plane, that little tiny guy. Oh, yeah, is that cool? It looks cool. See, that's the thing. It's like I've seen it. It's kind of cute. I got like these big, you know, catcher's mitt hands, and this thing is, feels like really tiny in my hands. And plus, it doesn't have the adjustable throat, so it's mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, I got my adjustable low angle Lee Nielsen block plane. I don't need another one. But so this one I had and I sharpened it like I sharpened, sharpened it. And I found myself using it in a completely different manner than my regular low angle plane. Um, I was, it's that there's that weird little sort of divot on that front instead of a tote, you've got that little kind of a indent there for your thumb. Finger button. The finger button. I found that I was sort of pinching the plane up front using that finger button. I was using it as like a mini smoothing plane, which I've never oh. used my block planes as smoothing planes. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I get that you can do that, but my blade is never set up for that. But I don't know. I just found it. It's it's a different animal. It's not replacing my plane, but now I have two block planes and they're very different things. Um, so I'm super excited by that. It's a really nice little tool. And I tried sticking it in my current apron. I didn't have a, a real pocket dedicated to it, but it was also a little heavy. Yeah. So on my new apron, I do have a slot sized for that if it's going in there. I'm not sure if it's going to go in there just from a weight standpoint, but I really like that little thing. It's just a nice little tool. I recently, for Christmas, my parents got me the Veritas version. Little, little, I think it's smaller. <clears throat> it's, I mean, it's tiny. Um, and I love it because there's so many times, and maybe like my plane collection is just, just getting smaller. There were so many times I'd grab my block plane to do something, and I'm doing small things now. And I'd feel like, ah, oh, this is, just, I can't, I'm covering the whole thing with this plane. 
Like I'm covering the whole piece. I can't mm. see any of it. Um, and, you know, six months ago I had my block plane and my bevel up jack. And those were my two. And now my go-tos are this teeny tiny apron plane and a number three. Okay. Yeah. So it's like the whole thing is just slid down three notches or whatever. Just to and, match the yeah. scale of your yeah, work. Yeah. yeah. I, I love it. All right. Let's take a break. As a Shop Talk Live listener, you know that if a project is worth doing, it's worth doing right. Pony Jorgensen takes the same pride in crafting their clamps as you do in crafting your furniture. Pony Jorgensen clamps are made using only the highest quality materials, and they inspect each one to guarantee consistency and performance. Head on over to PonyJorgensen.com to explore their wide range of pipe clamps, bar clamps, hand clamps, and one of my all-time favorite tools of all time, wooden hand screws. Pony Jorgensen, makers of clamps without compromise since 1903. Question number three is from Simon. I recently bought a house, so I, so I have room to finally have a shop. There are some 1950s era power tools at a relative's house up for grabs. A shop master bandsaw, table saw, joiner, a craftsman Douglas shaper, a craftsman lathe, and a mounted belt sander, unsure of the brand, and a stone grinding wheel. With the machines, there are a few motors to power them. A few of the motors were set up so one could power multiple tools just by changing the belt from one pulley to another. These were my grandfather's and great-grandfather's tools, so there's some sentimental value to them. The last time I powered them on was 15 years ago. As far as I know, they've been in somewhat temperature-controlled basements since the 50s. Would it be worth fixing up and chasing down parts for these tools? Are they safe and efficient enough to use, or would it be frustrating and dangerous? Would I be doing these tools more damage than good by having them in a Minnesota garage that's not heated or cooled? I don't have enough money to get each type of tool new, but refurbishing these old ones just to have them break and not work efficiently seems like it might be a waste of money. Do you see older tools like these being used in shops? So, th I mean, this is... A collection. What do you, I mean? Let's let's take it tool by tool. He's there's this craftsman bandsaw that we don't have. It's a shop master. It's a shop, okay. which is old Delta. I think I saw like a homeowner. Oh, oh, is that okay? I that think. looks like a pretty nice bombproof little bandsaw. Yeah, I'd say yeah. Get that thing going. And it's got a belt sander stuck on the back. Oh, there you go. How cool is that? That's cool. I think yes. Definitely. Yep. Um, one thing to look at on some maybe homeowner grade tools, but I don't think this one, is that the bearing block, I know my brother recently uh, tried to use a craftsman homeowner bandsaw and the bearing block was broken hmm. and it turns out as he goes searching for a bearing block like that's the piece that breaks on all of them so you're just looking for an right. intact one to part out yeah but if it's a bearing block with you know normal guide blocks and everything that you can yeah. fix and it seems heavy duty what could go wrong there's kind of two different categories of homeownerish tools one is just Low quality, you don't even want this thing brand new. Right. Stay away from it. Used, forget it. The other is just sort of smaller versions of bigger machines, but are still built yeah. really well. Like there's that little Delta 4-inch joiner, benchtop joiner. It's got that kind of L fence to it. But everything about that is solid cast iron, super stout, um, smaller band saws, even like a seven inch Walker Turner table saws, oh, yeah. which is a little tiny thing, but it's still built super, super well. And all of these tools feel um, closer to that category. Mm -hmm. of like, uh, no, this, if you get this up and running, especially if it's sentimental, there's a joiner right yeah. there. Was that a little four inch or six inch joiner? I don't know. It's short bed, but it's, if you don't have a joiner, yeah. that get new blades in it. As long as you can adjust the the bed's yeah. coplanar and everything, I don't see how you're going to go wrong. Yeah, that's a good point. There are some deal breakers in terms of getting it up and running and adjusted. 
like if you can't get the beds for a joiner, coplanar, uh, yeah, it's going to cause you a lot of problems. Um, on that little table saw, if there's a ton of run out in the arbor and it's really beat, you know, that, that could be. But if you turn it on and it works and you put a fresh blade in there. The fence and the lack of a... So is there a throat plate on that table saw that you could add a splitter to? Mm. Um, if not, that's a no-go for me. Yeah. I want to be able to add a splitter. I, t- I, I forced my brother to get a new table saw because he couldn't get a splitter. And um, in the throat plate of his, he had an old like 70s craftsman i think yeah and there was just some things that i didn't feel like the adjustment was going to work on um is the fence solid okay that's the thing but for me it's it's being able to put a zero clearance throw plate in because if you're doing high level work that's going to be something you want eventually and a splitter so he sounded like safety is a concern. Yeah. yeah. Are there any things that you want to look out for, like the insert, where, like, is there any telltale, like a janky jointer fence? Or are there hidden things? Or if you open it up, you go, oh, that doesn't, you know what I mean? I think it's more about are you able to set this up in a way that it does accurate work? Okay. I mean, I think, and that's, I think that's a huge safety issue. And that if you can't get a fence parallel to your blade, oh, right. that's a scary yeah. thing. Like the bandsaw, it didn't have a, I don't know the name of it, the pin that prevents the blade from jumping out of the slot on the table. The bandsaw? Oh, I, I lost mine. <laughs> okay, so it's not like <laughs> yeah. that? Well, no, that's the, that pin is actually to hold the the table in alignment because there's a big yeah. there's a big split through it. It's that casting. So can... the, the cast iron can actually move on you, and mine actually has. Yeah. I yeah. need to jam a bolt in there. Yeah. Um, you can get replacements. I know. I could just jam a bolt in there too, right? <laughs> this is the guy who likes the belt sander on the back of the bandsaw. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that little craftsman lathe—that was a sweet little lathe. I, I, I would have thing. no hesitation there. Yeah. Again, it's like if if you find yourself eventually hindered by these machines, yeah, then then upgrade. But if you don't have any of this, this is a, a windfall. You know? Yeah, these are cool. And I'd say that specifically because of the quality of these tools, not because when I was just reading it before I look at the pictures, it's like, ah, oh, no, don't even go there. I was thinking like an old beat up shop smith, something with a million attachments, which I guess those things can be okay. I'm not saying that. I'm just They're saying just inconvenient. I wasn't expecting to see this good of apparently the quality of tools here. That grinder. The, the grinder, I don't know about. That's an oddball. I've never seen that. I've actually. Uh, uh, relative brought me into his garage six months ago. I was like, hey, do you want this grinder? It was almost the exact same thing. Is that a wet grinder or no? It's just a big wheel. I think it's a wet grinder. Um, But I don't know if you're going to be able to get replacement wheel for it. I don't know. You just true that thing up. Call it good. Yeah. There's there's a lot going on. Would you sharpen your tools on that, Barry? He's sharpened his tools on a concrete floor. Well, that's why I'm asking. That's (laughs) No, I'm going to have a lot of work on the other end. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I don't know if I would expect to get like a perfect hollow grind off that. Because, so if that is a wet grinder and that wheel's been sitting in some kind of moisture, it's thunk, 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 right, just big flat on there. Yeah, unbalanced. Yeah. yeah. If you okay, can, so if that's you one thing to worry it. about. But what it, doesn't it also saturate? Like, isn't that a problem with wheels that sit in water yeah, as they can I've get? Heard that too. Punky is the only word that's coming to mind. Mm, I don't know. I mean, the well, the Tormek, I never store. I always lower the water tray down when it's uh-huh. not in use. So, Like, that's my only fear. But yeah. otherwise, yeah, you can take out some nicks with that thing for sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's got a guard. Mm-hmm. So if the stone explodes, you'd be okay. Um, I think grab it. And here's here's the other element of, of the question. <coughs> Sorry. Um. Am I doing the tools any good by having them in them? You're doing them a hell of a lot better than sitting in a basement where it's likely at some point somebody other than yourself is going to walk in there and say, get rid of this junk. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, anything you do that you can put them into use, you're yeah. not doing a disservice to these tools because I think you either use them or you throw them away. There is no yeah. collector value to this, I wouldn't say. Now, I I got a lathe from my dad that was like a lathe drill press combination and it needed some weird round bell and and eventually it was like, all right, I'm going to take the motor and scrap the rest yeah. you know it, it it absolutely had sentimental value but it was also going to be a hindrance to me right um <clears throat> i am not the type that will hang on to something just for sentimental reasons though yeah. were shapers more of a thing back in the day oh i wouldn't use that shaper okay because seeing a shaper amid a bunch of amid a bunch of homeowner tools was like that's weird yeah so does that mean like they, all the other homeowner tools are nicer than i don't know not that not that i it's not a good shaper. I mean, it looks okay. It's just that, I don't know, they scare me. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. Also, I wouldn't throw them away if I wasn't going to use them. Sell them. You can sell them pretty easily on Craigslist or something, I imagine. Yeah. For, the whole, price right. for the whole batch, 500 bucks. More. I don't know. You're just trying to find the right person. Right. I think so. I think you're you're looking for a collector who probably – Relishes saying I bought this whole thing for this whole shop for $127. Right. A hot dog. <laughs> All right. Question number four <clears throat> from Ray. I want to start pre finishing before assembly. I use a water based clear coat. For example, General Finish's high performance gloss. And I'm pretty sloppy. I use a PVA type glue, type on three. If I assemble within 24 hours of pre-finishing so that the top coat is dry but not cure, will the strength of the glue be affected? I feel like it shouldn't be because both the finish and the glue are water-based, but I'm not certain. I don't know the answer to that, but I would be dubious of getting finish on any glue surface. Right, that's where yeah. I went. Um, yeah, just don't be so sloppy. Agree. Or get a denim apron. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or maybe tape off the glue joints yeah. if you want. Or maybe just, um, I don't know how you're applying this. I know a lot of general finishes, you can just like wipe on a super thin coat with a rag. That might keep things from slopping around too much. Um. Well, okay, so right off the bat, we we could say that you do not put finish on the areas you're expecting to glue. Right. That's correct. No matter what, right? That's yeah. a rule. I think if, if that's a risk, depending on your circumstances or your technique for <laughs> applying a finish, skip it, glue it up, and then finish it. Mm -hmm. yeah, deal deal with the squeeze you. out, call it good. Yeah. I don't think that just because something's labeled water-based, um, it's likely, and Jeff, you might want to kick in here. Just because something's labeled water-based, it doesn't mean that the chemistry is going to match with other water-based labeled things. Uh, that just means that the that the solvent or the or the suspension is is a water-based suspension rather than it's waterborne. Waterborne. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because once it cures, it's it's its own thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I don't think that you want to rely on water-based labels or... Do a wash coat of shellac before you glue up. A little bit easier to apply and keep clean, and you can still finish with a water-based finish on top of shellac without a problem. That might be a solution. But you're still not hitting the joinery with it. You're still not hitting the joinery yeah. with okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Just get... Use blue tape vigorously on your joinery. Yeah. And then if the process <laughs> from cutting to finish blue tape on joinery, <laughs> but if the hassle of putting blue tape on everything to keep it clean is greater than cle cleaning up the squeeze out after gluing before without pre-finishing, I kind of weigh those things. Okay. Um, like Michael Fortune uses this product called Waxy Lit. He puts that around all the the areas to be glued, but instead of pre-finishing, he glues up. And then because this waxy lit stuff is on there, all the squeeze out, it just pops off. 
but then he has to get a toothbrush and then I don't know what kind of chemical he uses to get the waxy lit off in order to the finish to stick to the wood without being – and to me it was just like – That's I why mean, he has a, an assistant. No, but I mean <laughs> – and, and Michael's a fan. I mean he is like the you know, fantastic woodworker, so I trust that this process works really well for him. But watching how much is involved in keeping the glue from squeezing out, that all of a sudden went, oh, I don't want to go through that trouble. I'm going to find a different way to do it. All right. Well, um, let's see. We've got some good listener comments. Uh, I've gotten a lot, actually, lately. Thank you for them. Um, from ACJ901, this is a great podcast to have a bit of woodworking talk in everyday lives, even when you're away from your own shop. And from Daniel Whitner, this came in before the episode that I mentioned, the show notes the podcast is well produced and has excellent show notes it somehow manages to be entertaining and educational and i always learn something new and have a few laughs along the way love it we apologize for talking about pencils and aprons the whole time though i don't i don't yeah <laughs> so, <there we> go. <laughs> uh all right i have a recommendation um if you have even if you don't have any ch- ch- children uh mark rover on YouTube and Smarter Every Day on YouTube. It's like science-based cool. education kind of cool things. It's it's cool yet somewhat dorky guys going around and doing neat engineering things. And my son is currently obsessed with it. And every night after dinner, he, can we watch a Mark Rover video? It's like, cool. that's one of my favorite guys too. Great. Nice. So, yeah. Recommendation? Uh, yeah, Gene Toomer's Kane. It's a very little book. Harlem Renaissance, I think the 20s. Huh. And it's fantastic. It's the only book Gene Toomer wrote that was published. And it is, it's not a cohesive narrative. It's it's three distinct parts. And in those parts will be like a short story or four poems. And the last third, I think, is a play. But it's not cumbersome and obnoxious like it is in Moby Dick. It's much more, because it's not part of one overarching narrative. Mm. It's a lot more cohesive, I guess. They play well together. Anyway, it's fantastic and it's a short read and highly recommended. Cool. Uh, Recommendation, don't touch your face. (laughs) (laughs) In seriousness, um, be well, stay safe, stay healthy. Yeah, wash those hands. Yeah. We're out of soap in the bathroom downstairs now. Now that we got the sign how to wash our hands, we're out of soap? We're out of soap. That's kind of depressing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> now, is there going to be a soap shortage? Right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all for this episode of Shop Talk, Shop Talk Live. If you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into shoptalkatalk.com. If you're watching on YouTube, click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thank you for listening. I wasn't paying attention to any of that. I'm sorry. It'll be brand new for you. Don't worry about it. Yeah. This is entirely new information. My dad loves having a crappy memory. He's like, I can rewatch <laughs> the same shows and it's new every time. <laughs> <laughs> Darth Vader is whose dad? <laughs> <laughs>